right, come on in, everyone. We're about to get started. So hopefully this time it will work on this page. And again, sorry for the inconvenience, everyone. We're going to get started shortly. Hey, Sherry. All right, all right. Voila, there you are. <laughs> I don't know what it is with the business page. So we'll figure out that later. But hi, everyone. So we are here finally. And so we'll give it a couple more minutes because I had to tell people to transition to this page. Hey, Lori, again. Thanks, Lori, for hanging in there with me. <laughs> and so we'll give it a couple more minutes. Um, and Teresa, if you can post on your page as well that we've moved over to the personal page. Hey, Meech. Please share on to your, um, to your pages so other people can join and let them know that we're on this page. Teresa, can you hear everything good? Can everybody hear well? I'm, I can, but I'm getting a delay and an echo. Oh, okay. I don't know what that is about. <laughs> but I hear you very well. So um, let me see. All right, we're still going to allow time because um, the numbers are still going up, so people are still joining. So we'll um, give it a couple more minutes. We'll actually start at 7.05. Hey, Stephanie. Hey, girl, hey. So we'll give it to, let's say, two more minutes, and we'll go ahead and get started. And like I said, please let people know. Hi, Janine. And again, please share on your page that it has been moved to my personal page. So I'm doing a lot of multitasking. <laughs> so y'all bear with me. How's the weather? Some of you might be in Massachusetts. So how's the weather there? Hi, Katie. I see some hearts. The weather here in North Carolina is pretty yucky today. It's no fun. It's cold, icy. Okay. Teresa won't let me invite you again. So... Lisa. You were here and now you're gone again. Let me try again. Okay. It won't let me not get in Kentucky. I am hitting her name. It's not showing anything. Earlier she was on and it was she just heard a delay and so she dropped and then came back on and now it's not showing anything. Okay, so let me see. I'm about to add you now, Teresa. So let's see if that works. Yes, there you are. Is that better? Yeah, no delay now. <laughs> All right, so some people are coming in still. Hi, Kitty, how are you? I see people coming from my hometown. So people are still, the numbers are still coming up. So we're going to give it one more minute. All right. So while we're waiting for others to join, for those of you who are new to um, Saturday Seed. So I started Saturday Seed in July because I just really want to give words of wisdom to people. 
I am a single mom. I'm also a licensed clinical social worker. And I had started back providing therapy to people because my career had kind of taken another direction. So I started providing therapy again to people. And I just really saw the need, how people really needed, you know, some uplifting words. And I know that everybody can't afford therapy and I'm not out here giving clinical advice whatsoever, but just wanted to give some words of encouragement. So I started my Saturday Seed. Um, and while starting my Saturday Seed, um, it was also important to me to share with people my journey as a single mom. Um, the word Shiro, as all of you know, means a female hero. But I created an acronym with each letter that defines my journey as a single mom. So the S stands for sacrifice for my child. H is healing from my past hurts because I had to heal from my hurts and going through a divorce. And then E, evolving to what God wants me to be. And then R, revealing my truth because I had to be truthful for all the things I was going through, the things I was dealing with and where I'm at now. And then O, obtaining my goals and happiness. And I encourage people all the time to define your happiness. Everybody's happiness is different. But because we have social media now, so many people want to compare their lives to other people. And if they're not seeing their life in the light of that person or what that person's life looked like, they think they're not happy. But you have to define your own happiness. And I have really defined my own happiness and have, you know, set goals for myself and really just going after it. And so that's how She Row came about. And then I just thought about all my great friends and I have so many wonderful friends doing great things. And so I wanted to do a Shiro spotlight where once a month I spotlight a female that's doing her thing to just help people. Because when I was going through my darkest moment when I was dealing with my divorce, sometimes I just really needed somebody that felt the same way that I felt and could give me some encouraging words. Because sometimes when I would talk to people, they still didn't really understand because they wasn't going through what I was going through. So everyone that I bring on, every female that I, you know, going to spotlight, they're going to have a different story, a different journey. And so hopefully there's somebody out there that may be going through the same struggle and see this person has traveled that same road and see where they are at now, how they have overcome those adversities to get to where they are now. So the first person that came to mind when I thought about my first Shiro spotlight was Teresa. Teresa and I have been friends for over 10 years and her story is just so it's just just so inspirational. It just really inspires me. And we don't talk every day like we used to because we're in different states and we become moms. We have busy schedules. But every time I talk to her, there's no love lost. We just pick up where we left off. But not only that, I'm watching her from afar and all the great things she's doing and all her wonderful accomplishments. So I just felt that I wanted to have her share her story with you all today. And so it will empower someone, even if it's not a female, also a male. I don't discriminate. She rose and he rose. So Teresa, if you would just kind of let the people know where you're from, um, what you currently do now as far as your profession, and then we're going to get into Teresa's journey and her story because I have a lot of questions to ask her. And then at the end, I'm going to give you all the opportunity to ask her questions as well. So go ahead, Teresa, introduce yourself. Sure. Um, so I live in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, I'm a clinical social worker like Alicia. Um, I primarily have worked with um, populations and healthcare. Um, right now I'm in private practice um, because I'm back in school full time. Um, also working in private practice full time. So pretty busy. Um, I'm uh, back in school um, and nursing with the I'm in an accelerated program um, with the goal of um, after this next semester, um, which is my last semester towards my accelerated BSN of getting um, a master's in nursing to become a psychiatric um, mental health nurse practitioner. Um, and I have two little boys. One is eight years old and the other one is four. Um, and they both have special needs. So we stay pretty busy around here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Teresa. So first things first, um, when I met Teresa, um, she told me her story as, as someone who had childhood cancer. She, like some of us, we grew up, you know, going to school and having a good time childhood. She spent most of her time in a hospital. So Teresa, if you can share with us your cancer journey and what age you were diagnosed and, you know, just kind of share your experiences with that. Yeah, so I was diagnosed at 13, um, and I pretty much grew up in the hospital, um, I would say. Uh, it's like a second home to me, which I think is why I was attracted to, um, you know, working in a hospital setting later on in life. Um, but uh, so I was diagnosed at 13 with Hodgkin's disease. I got um, chemo radiation 
Um, and after a year, um, they felt that I was cured. And um, a few short months later, unfortunately, I relapsed. Um, and at that point, my treatment options were kind of limited because of the treatment I had already gotten. So I had a bone marrow transplant. Um, and they were able to fortunately uh, use my own uh, stem cells. Um, and um, unfortunately, that worked for me. Um, you know, I, I don't know if your next question is going to be like from there, but. Um, you know, once you're treated for cancer, it's kind of not like the end of it. Um, mm -hmm. So from there, I had a lot of um, long term consequences from it. Um, you know, the chemotherapy that I had damaged my heart. So I've had two open heart surgeries um, to uh, fix some mitral valve problems. So I have a mechanical heart valve now and I'm on, you know, Coumadin for the rest of my life, which, you know, affects a lot of a lot of things. Um, if you know much about Coumadin. Um, I ended up with infertility um, and so, you know, had to do the IVF process. Um, well, I didn't have to, but chose to. Um, and then um, I ended up with a secondary cancer from my treatment. You know, um, a, a lot of times, you know, they, they treat all these things to make you better, but unfortunately, um, you know, radiation can cause secondary cancers as can chemotherapy. Um, so I ended up with breast cancer um, about four years ago. So um, it's been it's been a journey. <laughs> right, definitely. So that was going to be my next question about the impacts of you having cancer as a child, and you described it well. So what would you say to someone who is dealing with um, cancer or actually a survivor of cancer? Um, I mean, everyone's cancer journey is so different. Um, and, you know, when I was treated, it was considerably different than it is now. Um, you know, every, every generation, they learn something new. And so mm -hmm. the harsh effects that I have as a child, they now realize that we didn't need as much chemotherapy um, as, you know, they give kids now. And now there's these, um, you know, genetically, you know, um, treatments that are geared towards your genetics and right. um, things that aren't, you know, as harsh on your system. Um, you know, but back then they treated kids with the same amount of chemo that they treated adults. So of course they did damage to us. Um, and that's, you know, that's hard to, to deal with as an adult knowing that they mm -hmm. could have done better, but they didn't know what they didn't know. Um, and I'm lucky to be here because to be honest, every other person that I treated with of all of us, only one other person lived. Um, wow. So I feel pretty fortunate. Wow. So when people ask you, what is your drive? What would you say to them? Um, you know, for one friend in particular that we went through all of our treatment together, um, my drive is for him, you know, he didn't get to live. And so I live for two of us. Um, mm -hmm. So there's an awful lot to do for two people. <laughs> Um, right. And wow, there's, I like that. There's, you got, um, about to maybe bring out the tissues, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I uh, I live for all of us that didn't make it. Um, you know, we weren't all so lucky. So, and I, you know, I realized from a very early age that something that a lot of times older people only realize that we're only given so much time. Right. Exactly. You know, life is short. And so you have to, you know, take every moment and use the best or do the best that you can in every moment and don't take it, um, take life, you know, for granted, for sure. Um, so I know you talked a little bit about your infertility um, because that was a kind of, you know, impacted by your cancer was a result of your cancer treatments. And so you have adopted two amazing little boys that I still haven't got to meet yet. But besides camera, we've talked, but not in person. I can't wait to meet them in person. But um, so you decided to adopt. So what made you decide to adopt you and your husband? I mean, I'm sure with the infertility, you felt that, hey, you know, we should do this. Um, but the other amazing thing that I feel with you and your boys is that you chose to tell them that they are adopted. Some people choose not to. And if you would just share why you chose to do that as well. Yeah, so, um, you know, we tried IVF because we felt like it was something that we should do. Um, 
I had worked, you know, my first job um, as a social worker was working for the Department of Children and Families. And so right. I knew regardless that um, somewhere in my journey that I would be a foster and adoptive parent um, just from having worked with those children. And in fact, when I um, left the department, I no sooner got a call to adopt some of the kids that mm -hmm. I had worked with, um, but I was still quite young. So I didn't take that opportunity at the time. Right. Um, and so, you know, later on in life when IVF, um, you know, we did four cycles and none of them ever took. Um, in fact, they caused some pretty significant complications that caused me to be hospitalized. Um, I knew that that was the point where um, it wasn't, you know, the right path for me. Right. Um, and also, not only was it not the right path for me, but... Um, you know, I, I now, you know, after that is when um, I had even bigger cardiac complications. So mm -hmm. I think if I had gotten pregnant, um, things, you know, maybe I wouldn't be here. So there was a reason for it. And I think right. that that is really important to remember that, you know, if something is put in your path that often there's a reason for it. Um, and so, yeah, we ended up adopting and honestly, like, my son is smarter than my genetics ever would have made him be and um, <laughs> cooler than both of them are cooler than my genetics and my husband's uh -huh. genetics ever would have made them be. So we're really fortunate. Um, as far as telling them that they're adopted, it's been an, um, an ongoing conversation. I remember um, so my oldest son came home with us when he was 10 days old. And I remember people asking us like, when are you going to tell him that he was adopted? And I was like, mm. we've always told him. And they're like, but he's a baby. And I'm like, but we started the conversation now because, you know, you start talking to them about it now. And to me, right. yeah, baby's still going to get some of it. Right. Uh, but you make those mistakes early on if you're going to say maybe not quite the right thing. Um, they're not going to remember exactly what language you used. Um mm -hmm. But, you know, you don't want your child to feel like you've kept things from them or that there's anything wrong with adoption or um, to me, adoption is a gift. Um, both of their moms, you know, one of them made the choice for us and one of them, unfortunately, didn't get to make that choice. But um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I want them to know that they were loved by us and by their moms and we talk about them all the time. Um, and so... It's just more people that love them and their story is important and it's a part of them. I absolutely love that. So do they have any questions and now since they're getting a little older, do they ever ask you certain questions and how do you handle that? Um, yeah, my older son at one point um, was really kind of missing his birth mom. And so he um, had written her some letters and we did send them along. I don't know if, um, you know, she ever picked, chose to pick them up because we have a semi-open mm -hmm. adoption. Um, right. We, you know, we encourage him to if he wants to, and we send them along. And if she decides to 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 pick them up, then she does. Um, but we, you know, we're open and honest with him. We let him know that, you know, we we don't know if she's in a that it was really hard for her to make that decision. Um, that she mm -hmm. really struggled with it because she loved him so much, and that sometimes it's hard for her to to revisit it and at some point right. hopefully they can if he chooses to that hopefully they can meet each other right i love that i love that um and i know you talked earlier with about the infertility that you felt that well everything happens for a reason um and so would you have any encouraging words to someone that is dealing with infertility um you know anything you have that you would like to say to them um, just, I know a lot of people keep it really private and, um, I think it's a really personal choice. Um, for me, I'm not a very private person. Like I have just always felt like, I mean, from the get go, my life has never been very private. Um, I just hope that when I talk about these things that it helps other people. Um, and I think that when you do talk about it, you find that there's so many people around you that are dealing with similar struggles mm -hmm. and help support you. So Right. Awesome. And so 
you do have an amazing husband, Andy. Shout out to Andy. Andy is the host with the most every time I've visited Massachusetts. He <laughs> takes good care of me. Funny story. One time I was eating at a seafood restaurant in Massachusetts and we saw the rapper Ludacris <laughs> dining. <laughs> and so we boosted Andy up to go over there and ask him, can he take a picture of us? And um, Andy took one for the team and went over there and disturbed that man's dinner. And he said, sure, after he finished eating. <laughs> and so when Andy tried to get in a picture with us, Ludacris was like, I know you're not trying to get in a picture with all these females. <laughs> but Andy did anyway. So he took one for the team. So go, Andy. We love him for that. Um, so how do you find work-life balance? Because as you said, you're doing all these things. So how do you find that work-life balance? Oh, I don't. I mean, I <laughs> when we rehearsed this, Alicia asked me the same question. And to be real, like, I you know, I do everything like at, you know, 75%. Um, <laughs> I do the, I do the best that I can with the time that I have. Um, mm -hmm. I'm fortunate to have a very supportive husband who picks up a lot. Um, he jokes all the time that he's a single dad. Um, Cause he spends so much time with the kids while I'm, you know, doing homework or, um, you know, and it's not to say that I, I don't do a ton for sure, but he, um, mm -hmm. he picks up a lot. Um, his family is also very supportive um, and helps out with babysitting and um, and things when he's working. Um, so we're really fortunate to have that kind of help. Um, so yeah, and you know, I talk with especially my oldest around what I'm doing and why I'm mm -hmm. doing so that he understands. Um, my four year old doesn't totally get it yet. Um, I told him this week that I was um, I was working a lot because I was trying to make up time because we we're going to Disney World next week and so I had to make mm -hmm. money for Disney and he keeps asking me <laughs> where the money is <laughs> <laughs> I know right he's like show me the money right <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I mean that's a very good point because the same thing here um, for me you know as being a single mom I don't necessarily have you know, that support in house, but it takes a village. So I have my family, my friends who support me, and I truly do believe in that. And also realizing when I do need a break or when I am doing too much, I try to spend that time with my daughter, but I also am very transparent with her and let her know, hey, mommy has to do this. Mommy has to do this because we want to do these big things and things like that. And she totally, totally gets it. But I do try to find that balance. But also, very good point. You know, our men, we have to, you know, give our men some kudos when they step up. And, you know, I find it so amazing. And there's been conversations, too, where people have about men and taking care of their children. It's so amazing to me sometimes when women be like, oh, yeah, my husband's at home with the kids. And people be like, oh, my gosh, you got your husband at home with the kids? He's their daddy. He should be. <laughs> um, so it's not, it shouldn't always be on the women. And that where we talk about gender roles and stuff like that, that's sharing the love. He's their father. So he should be just as involved in taking care of the kids when you decide, you know, you're doing your thing um, and vice versa. So I really love that about your, you know, family dynamic that Andy steps up and does his thing. Um, and so as we talk about the boys a little bit more, you know, with Milo, your first first one, um, you decided to start a nonprofit because of him. And if you can share that um, with us, but not only that, what was that aha moment? For you that made you say i'm going to do this nonprofit for my child i'm going to advocate for him yeah so um we started a nonprofit. um both my boys were born um opiate dependent with um natal abstinence syndrome um so both their moms used um heroin and then switched over um to um methadone <laughs> during the pregnancy um to you know because they wanted to give them the best chance um and i give them a lot of credit for that that they switched over to medication assisted treatment and tried to do their their best for both of them um and so um you know they're you know we were in the hospital with my oldest um you know again at 10 days old um and we were there for about a month and a day and um, the nurses kind of showed us what to do while we were there. And then, um, you know, when they discharged him, we went home and we kind of didn't really know what the hell we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the first night home, he didn't sleep. Um, we kind of poured a bottle all over his face at our first um, doctor's appointment the next day because we were so tired. Um, uh -huh. 
and from there it was just kind of like an adventure because um nobody really knew what to do with these kids you know this isn't a condition that's new but just the influx of kids from 2010 when the opiate crisis started mm -hmm. has just been huge um you know here in massachusetts they estimate about 10,000 children from 2010 until 2017 were born um oh, wow. and so as he got older you know he lived with a social worker and some of the things that we saw um just with his irritability um his inability to kind of regulate his emotions um and kind of calm himself down when he got um dysregulated um the intensity with it um and the length that it would last just mm -hmm. wasn't anything i had seen before um with my background with dcf or early intervention which i worked with um school social work um and i knew it was it had to have been related to um, his exposure. But um, at the point that I was seeing it, there still wasn't a lot of research out there. So, you know, I went out, I tried to educate myself, but nobody could give me the answers. Um, his pediatrician, the daycare providers, the school system, none of them really knew what to tell me. Um, the behavioral interventions we would normally do with a kid that had behavioral problems didn't work either. And so we started support groups. Um, and what we found was other families um, in our area were seeing the exact same thing and struggling in the exact same ways. And so we started the nonprofit. Um, and from there, we just um, built the services that these families needed based on the unmet needs, um, you know, in four years. And now we have um, here in Massachusetts about 200 families that are involved with us. Um, wow. And of those 200 families, most of them have multiple children. Um, we have a chapter down in West Virginia with about 100 families that are involved, also with multiple children. We get contacted mm -hmm. from across the country because, to my knowledge, we're you know the only nonprofit that does this work. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the process of doing a um, research study looking at the long-term consequences mm -hmm. of in utero um, opiate exposure, um, and those results should be available in the next six months. Um, Good. So, um, but yeah, uh, if you know, you know of any families that would benefit, our website is www.the2themoonandback.org. Um, and we, you know, we have a variety of services that we provide families. One of my favorite is um, the groups that we do with kids um, out in the community um, where we bring all these kids together um, to do different fun activities. Awesome. So the name again for our organization is To the Moon and Back, and they do take donations and kind of share with that, us about that too, Teresa. Yeah, so if you go on our website, there is um, a donate button through PayPal. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and some other social media. It's all um, at uh, To the Moon MA. Um, and so you can find us there. Yes, yes. That's so amazing. It's so funny because I just think about us back in the day and just who would ever thought <laughs> that we would be here in the places that we are. And just to hear that, that is so amazing of what you're doing with that organization and that now you have another one in a different location and just that it's just growing. So when you look at this and you see this, what do you think to yourself? Um, the organization itself? Yes. Um, I mean, I just think that <laughs> I mean, overall, I just see all the work that we've done in four years. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we passed um, a piece of legislature very early on that last um, year ended up with $1.2 million being passed. Um, and that was really important to me. Um, and that money was earmarked um, here in Massachusetts for programming for kids that were born um, dependent. Awesome. And I don't you know, knowing that that wouldn't have gotten done without us, um, the statistics, the numbers, the 10,000 um, mm -hmm. kids born from 2010 to 2017, that number wouldn't have been released if it wasn't for the advocacy work that we did. Um, so all of that's really important to me. Um, you know, it's for, it's for my boys, you know, and all the other mm -hmm. kids out there, so. Awesome, awesome. And the website is in the chat. So definitely, if you want to donate to a wonderful organization or find out more, please check out her website um, or Facebook page. Definitely a great organization to donate to and to support. 
Um, and so the next question I have for you, what has made you decide, I know you kind of talked about it a little early on in the conversation, to go back to school to be a psychiatric um, nurse and what are you planning on doing with that and what is your goals for that? Um, so, sorry, losing my voice. For the last four years, um, I had worked for one of the major hospitals um, in Boston and I was embedded in primary care as part of behavioral health. Um, and there's a lot of movement towards embedding behavioral health and primary care and other settings. But um, what I saw was that the needle really wasn't moving enough. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I see providers that are still hesitant to prescribe really basic um, psychiatric medications for patients that need them, um, barriers to mental health care, um, addiction medicine, um, you know, not being integrated at all into primary care and doctors, mm -hmm. you know, at one point I um, had addiction med come in and educate our providers and the our primary care providers still wouldn't prescribe the addiction meds mm -hmm. that they should have. Um, and so I feel like I was, I feel like I'm in a unique situation and that I've got, you know, almost 20 years of practice as a clinician um, in mental health, um, but the ability to prescribe, I think, puts me in a really unique position to be able to help people more. Um, and so it was something that I had thought about for several years and finally right. um, decided, you know, now's the time to do it, even though I'm old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're never too old. <laughs> Not, never too old. Um, and so I, you know, the pieces of the puzzle just kind of fit together. And so I finished up my accelerated um, BSN um, next semester. And then hopefully I'll pass my NYCLEX. And then I will start my MSN program in August, assuming that they accept me. Awesome. Awesome. I'm so proud of you, my friend. So what would you say you're most proud of? You know, listening to all these great things you're doing, we're getting a lot of comments in the chat people saying you're a rock star you're a hero everything so what are you most proud of <laughs> you're gonna hate this answer uh, what i'm most <laughs> proud of is not dying i guess <laughs> that's a good one though it's a good point because you've been no, through a you, lot honestly it, it took a lot like there are times when i could have just kind of given up um and it would have been real easy to have um you know, it wasn't always easy. You know, I, you can be sick and you can be cancer sick and being cancer sick three times, it wasn't easy. Um, so I guess in, in that sense, not giving up. Um, and then after not giving up on that, just, you know, pushing to, I mean, I've, I've also had the good fortune to feel well for the most part, other than the times when I've gotten knocked back down. Um, I think I feel pretty well, although a lot of my doctors say that I probably think that I feel well, but compared to other people, probably really don't, <laughs> but it gets to be your norm. Um, so I think just, um, you know, but taking everything and every day and living it to its fullest and doing everything that I want to do and realizing that tomorrow could be my last day on earth. You know, it could be the last day for all of us on earth. Um, right. so. And I must say, that's one of the things that amazes me so much about you. If you saw Teresa, you can't see because we're on Facebook technically. You say she's really small, <laughs> but she is feisty. And I think because she has that fight to live, that's part of her. And as you see, too, with her advocating for her son, she saw a need and she was just like, I'm not going to let it go. I'm going to go full force and I'm to, to change is made. And that's what I love about her the most. She doesn't let anything knock her down because I, can, I can't imagine, you know, having to deal with, you know, the bouts of can cancer that you've had to deal with and then just not just saying, you know what, I'm just want to give up. No, you said, no, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for my life. And you are here, and I'm just amazed by you. And just, oh, you're gonna make me cry. But anyways, um, and you recently dealt, dealt with something else recently, COVID. Um, your boys both had COVID. Um, you and your <laughs> husband were negative, right? And still negative. Um, so she fought through that as well. Well, not really, but <laughs> <laughs> no. But I, I think about it too in terms of um, you know, like my kids, like. Um, you know, I've gone toe to toe with some of the doctors for them, um, you know, at these 
major conferences where all of these doctors who are supposedly uh, the leaders in neonatal abstinence syndrome who tell me in one breath that these kids have no long-term consequences, no long-term needs, um, and in another breath tell me that there's no long-term research out there and how those, and I try to explain to them that those two things don't naturally go together. <laughs> right. Uh, and so, you know, calling them out on that, but I am but one person, um, a social worker, and to them, you know, lesser than them because they have an MD behind their name. But, you know, like me having grown up in a hospital and realizing that doctors are just people, um, mm -hmm. that they often have no common sense, um, having worked alongside them for so long. You got it. Uh, I think has you know has served me well and and that forefront like them telling me no um somebody asked me my our lead researcher on our research pro project asked me the other day she's like so when they've told you that what did you do and i said well i stopped listening to them and i invested all this money into this research that we're paying you to do so that i can go back later and say no but you were wrong <laughs> <laughs> But that's a great point. You have to be your own advocate. And that's me working in the hospital before and also having family members who were hospitalized and how the doctors didn't listen to them when they expressed certain symptoms and things like that. But you have to be your own advocate. And you're right. Doctors don't know everything. I mean, I ain't trying to knock no doctors if you on here, but it's true. And if you feel in certain things in your body and you're not getting the right answers and stuff like that, you keep advocating. You keep ad advocating to change happens and you do that. And I really admire you for doing that and not just taking the the no for an answer basically um so mm -hmm. what would you say your greatest struggle as a mom is um finding time you know like mm -hmm. trying to do these things that are gonna overall you know better their lives um while still trying to find the time for them you know same as most people but like on a pretty large scale, <laughs> you know, like, you know, building a nonprofit for them and their name, um, uh -huh. was like right. my love, my, you know, overall love story for them, but them not you know, <laughs> being able to totally like understand that right now. Um, right. and trying to help like all of their friends, um, or like, you know, like many moms do going back to school to hopefully be able to give them a brighter future, but like, showing them how important it is to have an education um but still trying to be present for them like in the here and now right right and that is key um, because sometimes we strive so much for our own goals we forget the present moment because we can't get that back though because we want to have memories with them so again it's finding that balance and like you said still striving to have things for them but also being present in the moment so that's a really great point um and so now we are at the end <laughs> so i'm looking at comments and we have some really great comments um i see your mom on there hey mom um, <laughs> a lot of great people so now this is time for q and a so if you uh, want to ask teresa some questions of course like i said we both are licensed clinical social workers so i'm gonna give a disclaimer we're not giving any clinical advice we love our license too much or we cannot give clinical advice but if you have some questions, um, and I see somebody, Jennifer says she's a cancer survivor to, for 20 years. So awesome. Any other cancer uh, survivors in the room, definitely put it in the chat. But um, so just looking at the chat, does anyone have any questions for Teresa or anything you would like to know? <laughs> All right, because I know it's a delay in the, the comments sometimes. So if not, I thank everybody for joining. Um, again, to those who joined me yesterday and had the technical issues, thank you for hanging in there with us. So now we are at the end. Drum roll. We're going to have prize giveaway time. And so I'm going to give, I'm going to, I'm all about supporting women and like I said, women empowerment. So today I am promoting a woman owned business. Her name is Erica Stribling. She owns Shea La Vie. 
And Erica is a nurse who was suffering with eczema. So she decided to create her own natural product. So you go, girl. And so she has skin care, hair care, lip gloss. And I am a customer of Shea La V. And let me tell you, her body butters have my skin all soft and glistening. <laughs> so her her um, business is in the website, is in the chat. So if you want to check her out and shop. But if you're in the Raleigh-Durham area, she's also located in the, her products are located in the Triangle Town Center. And let me pull up the name of the store. Sedona Ray Holistic Boutique, which is across from Barnes & Noble. So you can go into the store and get her products as well. So today I'm giving two people $25 to shop at Erica's store, Shayla V. So I'm going to come up with a question to ask based on our conversation today with Teresa. And Teresa's going to come up with one too. So be thinking, Teresa, what your question is going to be. So the first person who types in the chat with the correct answer, it has to be spelled correctly, no abbreviations, is the winner. And I have people monitoring the chat too, just in case I miss it. Um, and if you win the first round, you cannot play in the second round. We want to spread the love. So the first question is, what is the name of Teresa's nonprofit that she founded? Type it in the chat. And shout out to Erica. I see you on here, Erica. <laughs> Thanks for your support. To the moon and back, Michelle. Woo, 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 woo. Michelle is the winner. <laughs> so Michelle, I will be direct messaging you. Um, please get her name, my assistants. Please write down her name so I can direct message her. And I will get your information and we'll send that to you electronically. All right, Teresa, your turn for a question. Um, what is Alicia's business page? <laughs> what is my business page name? That didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? I think indeed. <laughs> Dig deep. Emily is the winner. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> Emily May is the winner. And shout out to Emily. She is the owner of May Marketing and Media. She is my marketing consultant. So if you're in the this area or not even in this area, because she has online, if you need marketing, Emily is your go-to. Thank you, Emily. She's so supportive of me and she's also a friend. So Emily is the win winner and I will text you, Emily, <laughs> with the information. So... I just want to say, Teresa, you are a shero. <laughs> so take your cape and proudly wear it. And I just want to say you exemplify my acronym because you have sacrificed for your children. You have healed from your past hurts being a cancer survivor several times, not just once, but twice. Actually, was it three times, actually? And then E, evolving. You have evolved into a mother, business owner, founder of a nonprofit, and so on and so on, about to be a nurse practitioner i mean you're just moving and just shaking and doing everything and then r you reveal your truth one thing i can always say about Teresa, and if you go on her page Teresa is so open about her life she tells you everything and that's very important because i think like she said earlier that sometimes we don't tell people the struggles we go through but you don't understand how many people you probably can help when you reveal your truth or either they can help you as well and then oh you're obtaining your goals you are doing your thing and so I'm just so proud of you. Although we had a little struggle getting this live on, we made it, y'all. And that also taught me not to give up. So thank you all again for your support. So Teresa has blazed it for the first one. So next month, I have my other Shiro lined up. So you all continue to tune in. Thank you, everybody, for your time tonight. And most importantly, thank you, Teresa. Love you. You all have a great night. Thanks for having me. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone.